Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Keith Silva. Today, we're talking about the number one crop produced in the United States, corn. But our focus isn't on the billions of bushels of corn grown each year in this country. No, we're focusing on a less well-known variety, commonly referred to as flint corn. These colorful varieties are used for more than decorative purposes. For indigenous people, these varieties of corn, along with squash and beans, known as the Three Sisters, fed their ancestors. Across the fences, Ben Willis visited the Board of View Research Facility in Alberg to learn how UVM Extension researchers are working with indigenous people to grow corn varieties that feed both body and soul. This is so exciting. Look at this. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. Today, we join Donna Tonietti and Faith Dubois as they visit a corn research plot run by UVM agronomist like Heather Darby. Here's the sweet corn I was talking about. Oh, okay. See I'm right Faith there. Dubois. Yep. I'm a community health worker at the Abnaki Nation of the Missisquoi, and I'm working there under a COVID grant, a hypertension grant, and the UVM Heritage Corn Grant. I'm Donna Tonietti. I'm the community program facilitator for the Abnaki Nation of Missisquoi. I also am the tribal membership uh, manager. To that, I work in the schools and libraries. Wait, I don't have the this is Faith and Donna's first time visiting the site, and Heather laid out a wide variety of last year's corn for them to view. So this is what people traditionally call right. Indian corn. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. This is what I need to be able to show the children yeah. because, you know, Children in Vermont go to the grocery store and they see yeah. you know, one or two types of corn. What yeah. they need to understand is this whole you know, concept of this is what the future holds. We, yeah. If we can start you know, raising wide varieties, then as climate change you know, happens, there's still a possibility of raising productive you know, yeah. varieties. Our goal is to find the ones that are adapted to today's climate and try to continue to select and breed so that northern flints live on. Look at all the different varieties. This is bags of <sighs> corn that we harvested that when, you know, when we're ready, it's ready to be milled up and, um, you know, send off to whoever needs it. Oh yeah, it. and we've been so, handing out the corn yeah. meal. It's so yeah. exciting to people, yep. you know, to be able to have And th this is a mill over here. This is wow. one of them. So if we want to go out and just see the corn quick and- yeah, I'd love to, this. yeah. So we all hop into Heather's truck and head for the cornfield. I started working on the project with uh, Chief Stevens from the Nohegan um, Abenaki community and also Frank Kutka from the Menominee Nation College. And just having conversations around our fear of kind of losing um, this type of corn that's really special to our indigenous communities but also genetic diversity that we don't want to lose with corn production in general. It's actually the, you know, it's the parents of all modern day corn, really. So, um, and plus I love corn. And I've been working a lot with food producers around the state that are also really interested in using flint corns to make tortillas and chips and all kinds of food products because flint corns are really tasty. They have great flavor um, and color and superior nutrition as well that most modern day corn doesn't have anymore. It's kind of the history of the project, some of the goals. So somebody's been helping them. Something. Yeah, it's a deer. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's why I said. Yeah, oh. it looks so so you know, wow. I'll, we'll come out here and we'll um, just pick the ones we love. We obviously want to pick from plants that are still standing. And for a flint corn, this is standing really well. A lot of the times they they have really weak stems and root systems. That's one of the problems with uh, flint corn. It has kind of shallow roots. So to adapt it better to climate change, we're trying to find ones that are better rooted. If you can pull it out of the ground yep. or kick it down, yep. it's just, you know, it's, it's not very good. The artist in me just wants to go through and just open every one up. It's right? like, I know, it's addicting when you're out here. Uh, yeah. I know. Like, and every time you're exciting. walking through it and you're like, oh, oh, I gotta keep that one. Oh, oh, I gotta keep that one. I mean, and, and soon all three are doing just that. 
I'm like, like a kid in a candy store. I know. It's kind of like um... As an educator, I love being educated. Heather, you have just made my day. <laughs> Okay, look at this one. It's almost completely red. There's hardly any other color in it. Look at that. This is a dream come true. Look at this. You know, we need to preserve our history and our culture, no matter who we are, what it is. But we also always have to be thinking about our future. Had most cultures, Abenaki or otherwise, been able to continue to grow their own food and grow the corn that they loved and the beans and et cetera, they would have already been doing this. You would have constantly been already selecting for whatever it was you needed. This is the inspiration for the beating that we do. It had to have come from yeah, thousands of years ago. Yeah, isn't it gorgeous? It's just... Yeah, I mean, to see these like, colors you know, look at this and one. know that, yeah, this is the this inspiration is one of my for favorites. the future. Oh, I love the colors in that yeah. one too. Yeah, they're, they're like glass beads. I had never even made that connection, actually. Well, you guys are welcome to stay and come back out. Oh, I will definitely yeah, come back. Or come back. Talk to you again. Yeah. In Alberg, I'm Ben Willis with Across the Fence. I'm joined in the studio by UVM Extension agronomist Heather Darby and Chief Don Stevens of the Nulhegan Abnaki. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Thanks Keith. Keith. Um, Heather, I think one of the big questions that people have coming out of this is, where do you get the seed to plant flint corn? Yeah, well, I got some <laughs> of the seed from Chief Stevens, and that was great. We were able to secure some of the Abenaki varieties that they are trying to preserve as well. Mm -hmm. But then I also was able to secure a bunch of the seed from the USDA germplasm repository, okay. which houses probably hundreds of thousands of lines of corn. Excellent. That's where I started. Well, I can <laughs> see Heather's been motioning, and Don, you brought some examples of uh, Native American indigenous corn. What are we looking at here? This is not corn that we normally see at our farm stands. <laughs> right. Uh, when Europeans first arrived, they would have found this corn, which is Kohasa corn. It's highly uh, packed in oil, and uh, and it grows in about 65 days, and it's about a four inch ear of corn, and uh, that's what Europeans would have found when they came, mm -hmm. and we still have that today. It's uh, Kohasuk, it's in our name. <laughs> uh, and it was uh, historically documented along the Kohas uh, meadows on the Connecticut. There was huge fields of, uh, of corn, mm -hmm. and that's pretty well documented. So uh, we ha we've, started growing it, uh, keeping it going after we received some of the corn back. Mm -hmm. The other corn is a pod corn. Uh, the last this one, here yeah, this fine. one is pod corn. Each kernel has a husk. So it's the closest thing to grass of where it originated out of. Right. Uh, and the last time it was documented was 1902 in the Boston Globe that we would mm -hmm. use it for our corn uh, ceremonies and we would wear it as decoration to honor the uh, the harvest mm -hmm. uh, and the corn mother story. <coughs> mm -hmm. So part of what I would like to do working with Heather is trying to develop the nutritional value of, of these corns and also um, what they are best suited for. Are they, especially this pod corn, are they a mm -hmm. popcorn? Are they a mm -hmm. grinding corn? Are they just decorative? Mm -hmm. So it'd be nice to, um, to start to explore that a little further, but you won't find this anywhere. Um, this is Abenaki um, pod corn. And before we started recording, I said, could you grow that, Heather? And, she, and you looked at me <laughs> <laughs> and you said, of course we of could course grow I that. Of course I can, yeah. <laughs> of course I can. Yes. Um, yeah. does, does this require any special, you know, uh, you know anything, anything as far as different. anything different than growing? <laughs> no, I corn? mean, plants are plants. They require the, they have basic needs just like mm. we do. And, um, you know, some plants are more challenging to grow than others. Mm. I haven't looked at the seed yet to see how much starch is in there, mm. to see how well it would germinate and things like that. But I'm sure we can figure it out and together. I, and I think <laughs> one of our projects too is some, we want to keep, keep some of this pure so it doesn't crossbreed mm -hmm. uh, and keep the seeds going as in, it, in its original form. But also I think we want to develop for climate change, how do we, how do we create corn or create something that actually 
um, will help us in the future and give us the most nutrition with the with the best growing time. Like the, like I said, the uh, Kohasuk corn grows in about sixty five days. Right, so long long growing time. That's well, that's long. short actually. Short. That's short. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Most corn that we have up at the research farm is you know especially grain corn. Mm -hmm. We are in the ninety. Okay. You know up to the hundred. So to have a sixty day corn is amazing, but what we really need to do, yeah. like Chief was saying, is we kind of, we have to adapt it today's climate, production, yeah. how we grow things, um, so that, like I said in the video, we're, we're maintaining our heritage, but at the same time, looking towards the future. Right. Right. Just, just a couple minutes left, really quickly. Heather, why is it important that UVM Extension work with indigenous yeah. people and, and Chief Stevens? Well, at UVM Extension, that's what we do. We work with people, communities, and the Abenaki community is obviously the oldest one here in the mm -hmm. state of Vermont yes, and yes. a community that's really important for us mm -hmm. to work with um, and make sure, like every other community in Vermont, that they have a secure food source um, as well as many other necessities. And it's been a real honor um, to learn. Mm. Um, you know, I'm a scientist <laughs> and uh, uh, Chief Stevens and others have taught me a lot about other really important aspects of growing crops that I had never considered. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been really exciting to me. And Chief Stevens, the same question for you. Why is it important for indigenous folks to work with UVM Extension? I think, uh, again, we have the cultural knowledge and what we traditionally did. And Heather is a scientist, so she has the data and she has the ability to dig deep into the data mm. and we're looking at it from the cultural mm. aspect and what we traditionally did they're looking at it from the data and i think it's a good marriage good partnership and uh if you think about new england is going to become more of a food hub for the nation right. uh and i think we need to be prepared and the more that corn has always sustained all of our people for throughout time so i think it's a, a nice project that if we can find ways to uh, create something sustainable and be able to adapt to climate change and be in the Northeast, I think it'll help the nation as a whole. Um, I, I, I agree with you. And as long as we have Heather to help grow it, I think we're, <laughs> we've <laughs> solved that problem. <laughs> well, thank you both very much for being on the program. Um, and thanks goes to everyone here at WCAX for making this program possible. I want to remind you that if you missed any of today's program or you want to watch it again, Find us on YouTube and Facebook by searching Across the Fence. Take care.